So pleased to have Professor James McKinney join us today. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us at the Power Hour today. Hi, Joyce. Good morning. How are you? Oh, I am blessed, and I am so glad to have you join us today, and I'm excited for you to tell the listeners about your new book about water. Now, let me just preface it by saying what the average person is probably going to think, big whoop, water. And why would you spend all this time after all these years writing about something that we all know about? Well, uh, the situation is, Joyce, most people really don't understand the situation with water. It's extremely complicated, what's going on behind the scenes. And uh, uh, some people may know a, a fun fact here or there. They may have read a National Geographic special on water with all kinds of what I call fun facts. But they don't understand the real issues with water. Uh, the, the control and ownership of water has been going on for many, many decades. Uh, something like oil, where uh, the people basically uh, in control of the world, and I go into that, I go into some, some higher level structure of who owns and controls the world, and I think a lot of people will be surprised uh, uh, we talk about bankers, New York bankers, but a lot of these people are simply middle management in a much larger scheme. Where does the old money come from? The old European banking system that runs our Federal Reserve, for example. Uh, all this is clouded, and it all comes back to water. I looked at uh, CNN, for example, this morning. We have uh, Edward Snowden in the news, of course, trying to skip from country to country looking for asylum. Uh, and he's exposing that the NSA is snooping on all of us, which we all knew, but he's got the data to actually prove it finally, uh, an inside employee who saw it. Uh, but what does that have to do with water? <laughs> Everything. This, uh, this top-down control, the snooping on the public, uh, is part of the control mechanism because water is the last great, oh, it's the last great thing they're going to go go for the ownership, the control. So anyway, yeah, water is not a whole hum concept. Uh, it's very complicated, and it's the most abundant chemical on the surface of the planet. And they're going to tell you that there's a shortage of it. Uh, they're going to use global warming, which is a bogus science idea, to tell you that there's a shortage of water and it needs to be controlled and harbored, and, and you can't have any, and you're going to have to pay a big price for water in the future. Uh, actually, with global warming, which is occurring, not because you're driving your SUV up and down the road, but it's occurring because we're coming out of an ice age. But the fact is, with global warming, there is more water. The ice sheets are melting in Greenland. The North Pole and the South Pole contain over 80% of the world's fresh water. It is daily pouring into the ocean, uh, going into the salt ocean and being destroyed. And nobody, no scientists, nobody in government, they're all turning a blind eye to this. We should be harvesting this water. But why wouldn't we do that? Because that doesn't play into the agenda of the people who want to control water and make you think there's a shortage of it. So anyway, I will stop talking for a minute. Water is an extremely complicated topic. Uh, the great aquifers of the world have been div divvied up and are owned, and the, the news is ab about to be tightened around the neck of the world. Um, I'll just say one last thing. In the book, I declare what I call, this is, book was released on July 4th, 2013. This, uh, I call it the Independence, the Declaration of Water Independence, which is a proclamation, something like the Declaration of Independence. It's simply a proclamation of natural law that nobody can own or trade or barter water. It is an inalienable right, just like your freedom. Um, and uh, the, the truth is, we don't live in a democracy anymore. We haven't elected a president. Uh, John Kennedy was an aberration. 
But really, we haven't elected a president for 100 years. They've been appointed. Uh, and everything the presidents do, the presidents are middle management. This all has to do with water and the control of water and the control mechanisms that have been put in place. Um, and so, at any rate, it's a very complicated, uh, toxic issue. So, uh, Joyce, I'll let you uh, comment. No, a I mean, bit there. listen, you're the guest they want to hear from. They hear from me all the time. But I do want people to know that this is an ebook, and you can get it at JM or J McCanny, and that's M C C A N N E Y Science dot com. J M C C A N N E Y Science. Dot com. That's how you get the ebook, and you do have a special in purchasing all of your ebooks, which are really, really worth it. Um, you also do a radio show on WWCR that people can listen to, and I think it's important that people understand that what we're talking about here is not just an inert item. Now, f for instance, we've talked about the power of water and the book that was written on water, the video that was done about the importance of water and the, the crystallization, the form of water. Now, is that something that you deal with also, or is that, or are you just talking about the shortage and the supply of water? Well, uh, I go into details. In fact, one of the great, great misconceptions about water is that it somehow came originally with our planet, and we have a fixed amount of water. It's not true. Every day, water comes into our atmosphere from outer space. It is constantly increasing by a very small amount, a very extremely small percentage amount compared to the total uh, amount of water. But water is a, a commodity. For example, we had a great flood, the Noah's Great Flood. It's a historical event. Modern science tries to negate that. The churches no longer teach it. They pretend like it's some kind of fairy tale. It never happened. We had an inundation on Earth. It was worldwide, and the oceans of the Earth rose two to 600 feet. We don't really know how much, but we know as many hundreds of feet. The entire water level of the Earth rose, and uh, just about everybody on Earth died. It was a near-mass extinction, but we know that this happened. That was because we passed through the tail of a large comet. Uh, we spent about 40 days passing through the tail of that comet um, in which uh, it rained also oil. Uh, so the, let's look at energy, something that is very related to water. Every time you turn on your car, every time you turn on the light bulb, you use energy. I've drawn an equation between energy us usage and water pollution. Water is not usable if it's polluted. And now we're at the point where we're polluting the oceans, the freshwater basins, the underground aquifers are polluted with everything from uh, chemicals to what you clean your toilet with. And I also talk about a system that is absolutely insane that everybody here uses every day. It's the toilet. We take human solid waste mix it with water, and then flush it in with all the other water that you use, the showers, the dishwasher, the everything else, and send it off to what we call a sewage treatment plant. And then we pour chemicals in the toilet that are toxic, extremely toxic, to, to uh, clean it and uh, make it bacteria-free. And this goes into the sewer system. We are polluting incredible amounts of water with human waste. And it never should have ever gotten to this point. We should have installed dry toilets across the board in the United States and then told people they cannot pour chemicals in the water. We would have such clean, chemically-free water today, you wouldn't believe it. We also don't save water. Imagine all of the rainwater. Just think of how ridiculous this is. We had flooding in North Dakotas and the Dakotas to the point where the entire Mississippi River Valley was flooded, but one state away in Texas, there was a drought. Okay, we're going to be back after this break with Professor James McCanny, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to talk about why you should be concerned about this after this four-minute break with James McCanny. This is Joyce Riding and the Power Up. 
Welcome back to Power Hour. Thank you so very much for joining us 24 minutes after the hour. Our guest is Professor James McCanny. The website is at the Power Hour Dot com. Go to the guest section and it'll be there. And in the email blast, you will find all the incredible information that Catherine uh, puts in the email blast for you to support what we're talking about here today. Uh, James McCanny, let's say I live in an apartment. I don't have any water on my property, don't have a pond, don't have anything. Uh, get my, um, the, my water from the tap. Why should I be concerned and why would I want to read the book Water? Well, uh Imagine you are going to pay $4 a gallon for water in the near future, uh, and you don't know that this is coming, and you don't understand why, and your municipal, your municipal water supplier is going to come under federal control, which it never was before. It never, never should have been. It should have been a local issue. It's going to be under federal control with federal mandates. The banks are going to follow the federal mandates. And I'll give an example here of, of this actually already happening, that require your local municipality to make large investments into their water system. Uh, it's happening in Canada. It's going to happen here. It's already happened here. And they're going to tell you, well, we had to uh, put all this money to upgrade our facility for federal water standards. And you're going to think, well, gee, I, I want my water standards high because I want good water. All of this is unnecessary. Uh, let me give you an example. In uh, Back in the Clinton administration, uh, I would say Billy probably doesn't know very much about water. Someone behind the scenes and up above him, because our presidents are simply middle, middle managers, that's what I call them, in a much yeah. larger structure. Mm -hmm. Billy signed an edict increasing the federal standard for arsenic in water. Well, how did he know where to set that? Bill doesn't know anything about arsenic and water and whatever. People have been drinking this well water in some cases for 100 years. They're not dying like flies. Arsenic is not good for you. But why would Billy raise that standard? Well, overnight, hundreds, uh, literally a high percentage, and this is the key, where did he know where to set it? A high percentage of the wells in the United States that were municipal wells became illegal under federal standards. And so the cities had to go out and invest large amounts of uh, water in infrastructure to comply with that standard. In come the banks. Gee, they're right there to help out. And then all of a sudden that well, that city municipality water supply, is under the jurisdiction of federal control. And, okay, well, that's federal, but this is all part of a much larger scheme. Uh, when George Bush Sr. retired from the presidency, uh, he handed over the reins to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton ramrodded through the NAFTA and the GAFT and all the other international agreements. A big part of that, a lot of people don't understand, George Bush Sr. moved to Canada in his operations, working through the Royal Bank of, of Canada to uh, RBC to uh, basically buy up banks around the, the Western Hemisphere and control water. At the same time, George Bush Jr. was in South America buying 100,000 acres of land that sat on top of the world's largest aquifer uh, in central Paraguay. That aquifer runs under most of the South American countries. They are positioning themselves to own and control water. Okay, so once they do, then they can tell you that there's a water shortage and make you pay enormous amounts of money. And so part of the book is explaining the background of what's going on worldwide, who is doing it, where do they get their power to do this, how is the United Nations involved, uh, for example, there were some farmers, uh, ranchers in Texas a number of years ago that went out and found a meter on their wells that they use for their cattle. And they said, well, what's this all about? So someone had come out and put a meter on there and told them they had to pay water rights. And so uh, some of them took the meter off and said, this is my water, it's my land, get out of here. Well, they came back put the meter back on and told them that if you take the meter off and don't pay us, 
you uh, you're going to lose your farm. You'll be out of here, and and that's the end of it. And they they made it stick. That was a United Nations uh, uh, operated operation. Now, a lot of people don't understand who owns the water. We think we have water rights. And what I'm telling you is they have been eroded to the point where you do not have water rights. And somebody's going to own that, and they're going to charge you. They're going to charge okay. you an exorbitant amount of money for water. When we come back, I want to talk about who is going to own it and how they're going to do this. I want you to get the book Water. It's an e-book at jmccannyscience.com. We'll be right back. Three-minute break with the Power Hour. George Riley. We're talking to James McCanny today, Professor James McCanny. The subject is water. Now, we were talking about why would I be concerned about water if I live in an apartment, don't have any water on my property? Does that mean I need to be concerned? He says, absolutely. Now, the control of water. Talk to us a little bit about who is controlling the water. And give us a, an example. With all the rules, regulation, codes, and UN guidelines that we probably... Uh, are going to have coming our way. Give us a worst case scenario, if you don't mind, James. What would be the worst case scenario on the control of water? Well, uh, okay, the the water itself being controlled, but also the facilities that deliver the water. <clears throat> As I was saying, the uh, the uh, facilities will become under uh, federal mandates. And uh, we're being told, in fact, the EPA study was just released saying that we're going to have to invest upwards of $384 billion over the next upcoming years in infrastructure upgrades in water systems. And uh, this may possibly be partially true, but you can see that the EPA is a hand of the government, which then, well, gee, where is this $384 billion going to come from? That's where the World Bank comes in and says, well, gee, towns and municipalities, you don't have the money to do this. We'll loan you the money. We're be such good stewards. Uh, the Royal Bank of Canada has been doing a survey, a citizen survey of selected people in Canada, and they're trying to push the idea of water awareness. They're just pretending like they're good citizens. They have cleanup projects where volunteers and when a bank gets too friendly with water, it worries me because, let's, let's face it, Canada is the second largest country in the world, and it has probably the most uh, fresh water reserves in the world. So when the Royal Bank of Canada gets too friendly there, uh, basically the, the water of Canada, uh, through a pact, and this is why I was talking about NAFTA and GAF before, is because that was instrumental in taking over the water rights of Canada. What's George Bush doing in Canada, operating internationally, controlling water rights in South America? You have to understand who your enemy is. Let's take an example in a small, uh, middle-sized country in South America called Colombia. The Magdalena River, which is the equivalent of our Mississippi River, it cuts through the entire country, was given to European international corporations. Given with all the water rights that go with it. The people in that uh, lived around the river were thrown out, the indigenous people, and they were told if you take one drop of this water, you'll be put in prison. <laughs> the, you don't understand wow. what's going on here. The world water rights are being taken over. That's why my book, <clears throat> I proclaim the, the independence of uh, a declaration of water independence, because this has to supersede your government. Your government now works for the entities that are basically taking over the thing that everybody needs every day. Uh, we talk about banking or financial crisis. Well, people can live through that. You can go without money for a few days or even a few years. You can go without car. You can drive an old car and, and transportation. You can get by without that. But <laughs> talk about water, uh, that's something that everybody needs every day. So if you want to control something that is essential to everybody in the world, uh, control water. So it's more it's a more of a controlling factor than money. Uh, let's look at third world countries where water has been polluted beyond recognition. 
And, uh, you know, to the point where people don't have that inalienable right to fresh water. Uh, I, I, I travel a lot. I have seen people going miles and miles with five-gallon buckets or containers, and I was trying to figure out where all these people were going to to get their water, and they finally get there, and they're going down this hill, and there's a mud hole, and they're getting their water from that and then walking back the five miles, and that's what they use for water. This is the water source in, in a place where there was abundant water. Clearly, there's a problem here. Uh, worldwide and the control of water, uh, and you, you think, well, gee, this couldn't happen in the United States, but it's already happening. Uh, the Great Oglala Reservoir that extends from Lake Winnipeg down all the way into northern Texas is drying up. A guy named T. Um, what is it? T. Boone Pickens bought some just rangeland in Texas and created a town there. And the whole purpose of the town is to pump water out of the Oglala Reservoir and then feed it off to the major cities of Texas. Uh, these people are working behind the scenes to own and control water and then sell it. Uh, T. Boone made the comment that he made his fortune off of oil, but that's nothing compared to what he's going to make off of water. Water is, uh, there was a, the lead article, I remember back in uh, 2000, Forbes magazine had Bill Clinton on the cover, and the topic was water would be the oil of the 21st century, the, of the current century, mm -hmm. uh, because of the, the profit that could be made off of water. But you can't make a profit off something if it's readily available. So you have to create a shortage, and that's why I'm saying first you, just like oil. Uh, back in the, oh, a couple of decades ago, I was friends with a guy who worked in the computer systems of the big oil companies, and he knew all the geologists. They came in and out, and they, they, they were the database computer systems for the geology departments of the big oil companies. That's where he worked. All of a sudden, they started laying off all the geologists. He's going, well, what's going on? There's an oil shortage. We should be out there finding more oil. And they said, oil shortage? We found more oil than anybody could possibly ever uh, uh, harvest in, in, within the next 100 years with increased usage and everything. Uh, there's more oil than we know what to do with. So they were laying off the geologists. Yet you were told that there was an oil shortage. Uh, the uh, same thing is going on with water. We have abundant fresh water. We don't have a water shortage. We have a water management problem, and it's worldwide. Uh, this is on purpose. And so that's what the book is about. Now, there again, who's controlling the water? Well, uh, the, like I say, the United States are talking about $384 billion investment that has to be made in water infrastructure. This is the technique that the banks the World Bank and its subsidiaries have used around the world to take over resources in all the third world countries. I re reference a book, uh, John Perkins' book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, in which they go into foreign countries, uh, po set up polit political parties, get politicians elected, and then they sign up for these enormous loans that come from the World Bank and it's like, oh, we're going to help the society, we're going to help everybody. But they know that these loans will falter. When they falter, then they come in and then they take the resources through international corporations, etc. When I was talking about uh, the, the handing over of resources of the main river Magdalena of Colombia, they were handed over to some European international corporations. But those corporations, every couple of years, change hands, change names. They're like, they're like moving targets. The people would try and sue these corporations. And, and the point is that those are facades. Those are working facades, and the people behind them are invisible. So one of the points that I make in the book is you have to know who your enemy is. If you're fighting these straw horses out here, uh, in facades, you're going to burn up all your time. 
you know, a lot of people say Obama is the problem. We got to get rid of him. He's middle management. You you got to find out who he works mm-hmm. for. If That's you right. want to get rid of the problem, don't worry about him because they'll put another guy in there that does the same thing. I just read an article today about how Obama has just carried on all of the Bush uh, programs. In fact, he's expanded them as far as monitoring the public and, and, and snooping on the public. He's expanded them. At first, they denied that the NSA would ever do that. Well, now they're admitting it and saying, well, it's okay. But you have to understand, Obama is middle management. The Bushes are middle management. When I say George Bush Sr. is is in Canada working with the Royal Bank of Canada to overtake water rights in South America, they are middle management. They're doing the bidding of people that are way up on top. So you have to find out who your enemy is. Now, let me just Um, ask you a question, because you keep mentioning George Bush Sr. working in Canada. The man looks so frail. He just got out of the hospital after 60 days or something like that. He lives in a wheelchair. Are we talking about the same George Bush Sr.? Yeah, yeah, um, yes. And, uh, yeah, he's he's fading out, I would say that. And his useful years have passed, but he, after his presidency, um, you have to understand where he came from. Uh, his dad was trading uh, with the major international corporations during World War II. When the World War II ended, uh, remember the Trading with the Enemy Act? Mm-hmm. One of the main targets of that was George Bush's dad, who was uh, moving raw materials and, and manufactured goods to Hitler's Germany during World War II. Uh, that, that was George Bush's pop that was doing that. Okay, so here after World War II, they split up the U.S. or the German scientists, the nuclear and the rocket scientists, and the other scientists, chemists, etc. Some go to Russia, some come to the United States. But they brought the SS intelligence people who should have been in prison. They brought them to the U.S. to start our CIA. Well, they got some American guys, Wild Bill Donovan, in Dulles, the Dulles brothers, to start the CIA to give it an American view. But the real people behind that were the people that worked for the international bankers. A lot of people don't realize we never won World War II. The bankers won. And all of the wars, subsequent wars. Uh, But anyway, George Bush Sr. Okay, explain, explain if you would that the bankers won. Explain that to the listeners. Uh, well, the, the, the last thing Hitler said, his recorded thing he said, was uh, save the banks. In other words, um, to, to shut the banks down so that the banking system was solvent. And this was the same international banking. This is the Rothschild banking empire, which grew out of the Middle Ages Vatican. Uh, the Rothschilds were the, the basically the banking entity for the Vatican. And so you have to understand historically who has been operating uh, behind the scenes. In the, the Vatican, through the Middle Ages, uh, they were responsible for uh, international marriages between countries. They okayed it. They, they okayed wars or told people not to start wars. When the vast wealth came from the New World in in form of gold and other resources. Uh, This came into the the Rothschild banking industry. The England, of course, and Spain were subsidiaries of the Rothschild banking empire. So when Spain lost in the Spanish Armada uh, and England took over power of the seas, uh, the banking industry sat on top of this. The banking industry sits on top of the whole world. And like I say, when Obama or the Clintons or the Bushes, you talk about them, they're middle management. If you see somebody's name, if you, if you uh, know who they are, they are not leaders. They're middle management. You never see the name in the people who are actually running and pulling the strings. Uh, so at any rate, uh, after World War II, George Bush Jr., as a kid, was ushered in and later became uh, into the CIA and later became the head of the CIA. All of these people revolved around the banking community of New York, the CIA, the Department of Defense, etc. And so that's who runs this 
country of the United States. When we're talking about water control, look to the same people. And so they're using the same control techniques they used in third world countries to put massive loans on the water systems, then they control those water systems. Now they can control the distribution and the price and tell you that there's a water shortage when there's vast water supplies that are going wasted. This is why I was talking about the, the flooding in North Dakota when you're having a drought in Texas. Why don't we have a system every spring we get massive amounts of water running down the Mississippi River into the, into the sea wasted when we have the Southwest that's crying for water? We could have Arizona and New Mexico green. All we got to do is put that water over there. <laughs> Why doesn't anybody do this? Like I say, we have a water management problem. We don't have a water shortage. We have massive amounts of fresh water. We just don't do anything with them. We waste them. The, uh, the great ice shields in Greenland, Antarctica, and the North Polar Cap, to a lesser degree, are melting. <laughs> We're not doing anything with this water. It's flowing into the sea and becoming salt water. Uh, that water should be harvested and brought to places where we need water. Uh, the world has a water management problem. Yes, yes. All right, we've got a three-minute break. We will be back, and I'd like to take one phone call. Uh, if you have a question or comment for Professor McCanny, we'll take your phone call at 855-995-6923. 855-995-6923. We'll be back in three minutes. Stay tuned. Today of the Power Hour, we uh, are talking to Professor James McCanny. The subject is water. It is critical. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not kidding about this being such an important subject. Go to his website, uh, jmccannyscience.com. It's in the email blast and also at the Power Hour. Send this program out to everybody that you know that cares about water, which means every single person. Take it to your church and to your school as an issue. I wish we had time to talk about action items, but I think that's something maybe we can get to next time with Professor McCanny. What can we do at this point is, is the logical uh, follow-on to all of this. Um, but get the book, the e-book, at jmccannyscience.com. Let's go to Kevin in Ohio. Kevin, you're on the air with uh, James McCanny. Go ahead, please. I'm, I'm, I'm honored, privileged to speak to James McKinney and you. Um, well, as a you. soil scientist, I've talked to you several times in the past. He's absolutely right about the uh, wastewater treatment systems. Uh, I worked with, uh, when 1992, they stopped ocean dumping of all sewage waste treatment uh, products. And they started moving them out of New York and the eastern states into Ohio to land spread it. That's a big, that's the one I fought for a couple years before I left the state's employment. That uh, I got into composting toilets. I produce that product that makes composting toilets work, the compact one. We're really? Built. What is your website? Go ahead and give your website. It, it's compoststarter.com. But we, we, we build one in Toledo, Ohio now, a composting toilet, where the Swedes were always building them, and some in Canada. But uh, I would love to talk to you about this time, sometime, Joyce. I've been doing it for almost 18 years. Okay. And, and we, the composting toilet is the answer. And I, I want to hear... James addresses, uh, Mr. McCain, I, I thoroughly uh, trust what he has to say. And okay. it is the issue. What do you want to hear him address? Go ahead. Which, uh, real quickly. Uh, well, he was, he was saying people should be using dry toilets, and he's absolutely right. And okay. I would hope that you would carry my products to supply these to people. But they, okay, they, call they, me at the power thing. hour. Call me at the power hour at 877-817-9829 after the show. Call me, and we'll talk about it, okay? God bless you. All right, yeah, Kevin, and, uh, Kevin, I would like to talk to you about that, too. In fact, I use dry toilet. I have reduced my personal uh, energy water resource footprint to zero. It's something oh. I said, okay, now you should do this, I should, and I'm going to do it first to show you that it can be done. Uh, but using a dry toilet is one of them. The waste product, after six months, you take the, the drawer out of the bottom, and you can go out and put it in your garden and grow tomatoes with it. 
uh, this is, you know, the fact that we're polluting vast amounts of water and then adding chemicals to that water is insane. It's got to stop. But in my book, Chapter 30, it's an individual to-do list, and I have 12 things that are worldwide projects that we have to do on a world scale that everybody has to help with. But then I also have an individual list of 10 tasks that everyone can do. The very first thing on that item is to use dry toilets. Then the second is to reduce your energy water resource footprint, and I tell you how to do that. Uh, and then uh, it goes on from there. But uh, the issue with water is uh, critical in sewage and sewage treatment, uh, the, the way it's set up now. Just think of all the plumbing and the, the tubes and the pumps and the, to move this water. And then once it gets through the, the, the sewage treatment, we think, oh, it's clean, and they dump it back into the uh, river or a lake. Or, and and uh, it, it is chemical. they don't take the chemicals out. It's absolutely insane. Okay. We, but, I want to have you back on again, uh, Mr. McCanny. I'd like to have you back on again, and definitely we'll be in touch with Kevin in Ohio. I am just so thrilled to see that our listeners intersect with the subjects here in such a vital way. You have a blessed day. Thank you so much, James, for joining us on the show, and we look forward to having you back again soon. Thank you, Joyce. You bet. science.com He has a radio show, website. It's all there, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about the truth and empowering you. Please answer your uh, surveys that Catherine sent out so we can find out what you want on the Power Hour. We love you all at the Power Hour. It's all about the truth. Y'all bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a blessed day.